Okay. Hello, everyone. Here we are again for another Mavens Do It Better podcast where we interview extraordinary experts who bring a light to our world. And this is actually um, times two because <laughs> my guest today, the lovely James Underdown, uh, a wonderful, amazing friend and maven. Uh, we recorded one a while ago and I don't know, we don't know what happened to it. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> Sound was a little messed up, and then I think it was gone. I don't know. So, Jim. it just disappeared. <laughs> and you know what? No, nothing has changed in the world since then. So let's just say the same stuff again. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, we 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 talked pre-pandemic. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. The pandemic, if you count that as a change, okay. <laughs> A slight change to plan. Minor change. Okay. Yes, minor change. Well, yeah, um, but we had this awesome conversation, and I was like, darn it, we're going to have another one. So yes. <laughs> we decided to get together today and uh, have another one. And um, we met through a, a mutual friend, and, uh, and Jim was telling me all about his amazing, cool job. And I was like, what? What is what is the Center for Inquiry? What is that? And so um, I'd love for you to tell our listeners, kind of give, tell them what you told me about this cool thing that you do. So. Yeah, it is a cool job. Um, and I've had 40 jobs in my life, so um, I, I had a lot to choose from. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for Inquiry West in Los Angeles. And the Center for Inquiry basically promotes science, skepticism, secular humanism, the rights of non-believers in religion. And uh, as a part of that, I run a group called the CFI Investigations Group that offers a quarter million dollars for anyone who can prove paranormal ability in a scientific test. So we've been for 20 years uh, testing people who say they can do all these miraculous things and offering them wads of money to come <laughs> forward and, and uh, show it to us. And hasn't wow. happened yet. No, has anybody gotten close? The closest anyone ever got was during one of our rehearsals. Uh, one of our people was sitting in, uh, in, the, chair, in the psychic's chair and guessing these cards that were being flipped over and he got like the first three out of five right which was you know like it was well the odds are 125 to one to do that just by luck alone but he did it right so i'm kind of looking at him sideways like what <laughs> what's going on you're cheating you're one of us and you're cheating he said, no, I just got lucky, and he guessed a few more, and he started missing, but uh, right. yeah, that, that was the closest anyone ever got, one of our people. That's amazing. How many um, entries do you get a year? Well, um, we just launched our new website, CFIIG. I know um, it. Yeah. Um, I so would like it we, different. We, yeah, <laughs> we've just got a, a ton of them just came in, mm. but I would say typically we get... Um, so like one to three a week. So, you know, between 100 and 200 a year. Okay. But we don't test that many people. Right. Because um, most of the people, when they find out what's involved with the test, and I always tell them, you know, try this at home before you come to us. Right. And some of them are in uh, on other continents anyway. Mm -hmm. um, they figure out they can't do it. And so they never show up. So we really only test a handful of people every year okay yeah that's wow that's amazing yeah we just tested a guy who said he could uh just this last saturday which i believe was the first test for paranormal prize money during a pandemic <laughs> in history <laughs> wow okay so we got yeah. that going for us which <laughs> is nice um and uh, so this guy said he could throw um, electricity out of his fingers and he could make lightning appear in the sky and he can also teleport himself like three to five feet. So we social distanced and put our masks on and <laughs> went to CFI West on Temple Street and um, he showed up and I, I checked the weather before we agreed. Right. 
Uh-huh. There was no freak thunderstorm in Los <laughs> Angeles. Wow. And uh, yeah, he showed up and um, he couldn't do any of that. Uh, <laughs> He didn't bring his Tesla coil. That sounds like no. Yeah. Well, we did wand him. We we always check people for concealed technology, right, right, and weapons, and um, so we checked them for all that. And uh, you know, we were looking for a little mini Tesla coil, but right, he said yeah. he didn't need it. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that out um, actually out at Burning Man. Megavolt, Megatron, Megavolt. I think Dr. Megavolt was the guy that would bring a giant Tesla coil and do the whole thing. I mean, there was obviously a Tesla coil there, but, but yeah. it was actually pretty cool. It's cool. I mean, it's, it's yeah. we love real science. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, he was supposed to be able to do it without the Tesla coil. Absolutely. Will you talk a little bit? I, I know the history of CFI is so rich. Will you talk about the history of it and you know, I think, and maybe do a little explanation of sort of skepticism and secular humanism as well. Yeah. So first of all, uh, skepticism is not the same as cynicism and it's not the same as denialism. So when people talk about, some people call themselves climate skeptics or something like that. That's not us. Mm. Uh, true skeptics in my world are people who use science uh, to test ideas that you know may sound on the surface to be a little bit crazy, but you, we use science and scientific method right. to try these things out. So whereas a denialist is someone who it doesn't matter how much evidence they you show them, they'll still think you know the Earth is flat or the uh, climate change isn't happening or whatever. Right. But um, CFI has its roots in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, you're too young for this, but um, <laughs> back in the 60s and 70s, uh, UFOs were experiencing this big uh, resurgence. Um, there were big tests going on of psychics. Uh, this guy named Uri Geller was doing the Johnny Carson show and bending spoons. Uh, the first Bigfoot sightings were uh, I recorded on film wow. and all this stuff. So this interest, the Bermuda Triangle, was all this interest in and all this weird stuff that was happening. Um, so some of our people, uh, Paul Kurtz and James Randi and Carl Sagan and Isaac Asimov and, and Ray Hyman and some other people got together and decided to form the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. So they wanted to put science on the case of all these claims and use you know real solid methods to try to get to the bottom of this stuff and that's when they started skeptical inquirer magazine which we still publish uh so that was like 76. uh a handful of years later uh paul kurtz who sort of organized all this stuff um who was at one point part of the american humanist association decided to start a humanist magazine Free Inquiry magazine and co uh, create the Council for Secular Humanism, um, which deals with humanism and separation of church and state and, and religious and philosophical issues. And so those two groups, the skeptics and the humanists, mm -hmm. combined together to form uh, the Center for Inquiry. But now we have an evolution teaching uh, program called TIES. Uh, that teaches evolution to, to school teachers. Um, we have the uh, My Investigations group. We teach people to be secular celebrants and uh, perform uh, marriages. Um, there's just all kinds of different stuff mm -hmm. under the umbrella of the Center for I'm, I'm ordained under the Secular Humanist. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> now, did you send in for that or how did you get that? It was years ago. And yes, I did. Um, a friend wanted me to do a, they, a renewal. And so I was like, well, I should probably be official. And so, yeah, I haven't actually married anybody, but the, we did it for a, a, a renewal of marriage vows. But that it was years ago. I don't even know where, where it is, to be honest. <laughs> but I, <laughs> yeah, I, know I, did still, it, I got a piece of paper. So. Are they still married? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so I did a good job. <laughs> they I did was, a good job. <laughs> I was keeping track for a while. I think I've done 
35 weddings. Oh, wow. And um, that's a pretty good rate. I think I'm like, you know, 30 and 5, 29 and 6, something like that. There's a few. Yeah. Don't ask me about the matchmaking. Although I know I never really do that on purpose. It just sort of happens. But then they're like, you did this. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. You know, I just introduced you. So, you know. <laughs> well, when I interviewed a couple before a, marry, uh, a, a wedding ceremony, mm -hmm. I always say, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> And a lot of them just laugh, but one of them, <laughs> I met it, and some, like a Denny's or something, we had breakfast, uh -huh. and they laughed at the question, and then like three days later, they called up and they said, you know, we started thinking about it, and we really don't. Oh, wow. Said, well, better to figure that out now than in five years. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. So, um, Humble Beginnings, which we connected on, um, Yes. The no, night we, we met. Night. Yes. Yeah. Wheaton, Illinois. <laughs> what was crazy is so we figured out we went to the same high school. Yep. What yeah. are the odds? Yeah. You know, you're sitting around, you're at a friend's house who you know pretty well. And, you know, you, you obviously uh, know that crew much longer than I have. And it was one of those we were sitting by fire and chit chatting. And, you know, you get to that where you're from and where you're from and got it down to Wheaton Central. So, I mean, ridiculous. Like, <laughs> yeah, because everybody says, you know, you say, oh, I'm from Chicago. I was actually born in Chicago, but right. I'm from Chicago. Yeah. And if you pursue it, yep. you know, we're at Western Suburbs. Well, which one? Wheaton. Where'd you go to high school? Yeah. I, yeah. I might have told you that night, though, I had the same experience with a woman in Juneau, Alaska. Did I tell you that? Yeah, maybe. Tell me again. Tell me. Yeah, again. so we, it was the same kind of thing, you know. It was like I had a, a Red Grange shirt on. Red uh, Grange, for the vast majority of the audience who doesn't know, mm -hmm. uh, was the first superstar of the NFL. He was a big college football star, and he's from Wheaton. He was called the Wheaton Ice Man. He went to University of Illinois. So I had this shirt on, and we, so I started talking to this woman at this little shop on the edge of Juneau, Alaska, and the same thing happened. We ended up finding out that we went to the exact same high school, and she went to school with uh, John Belushi, and I went to school with Billy Belushi. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So, whoop, whoop de do. Yeah. I, I remember, do, did you remember a, a typing teacher, Mr. Day, by chance? Like, typing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I do remember typing. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if Mr. Day was there when I when when I was. Okay. There. Yeah. So, y'all, we took typing yeah. in high school yeah. on a typewriter, <laughs> and Mr. Day's claim to fame that he taught both John and Jim typing, and so he always mentioned that. You know, do you remember? You know that I taught the Belushi brothers, and you know. Well, so the crazy. question is, can the Belushi's type? Yeah. Right. Not. <laughs> did you teach them did they, did learn? they learn anything right yeah completely yeah i reconnected recently with one of my um old teachers and had a really nice exchange with her on email hadn't talked to her in a long time and sort of kind of found her and uh it was neat to yeah, you know talk to, talk to somebody who knows who knew you you know and and you know talk a little bit about writing and like can you tell me a little bit about me? Like, you know what I mean? Like just, you know, if you remember anything and it was really cool to like have that connection with her and have a conversation. So I don't get back to Chicago as often as I'd like, but, um, but yeah, it's a good place to be from. So. It's, it was weird because I was, I was back in Wheaton um, a few weeks, just a few weeks ago. Right. And um, I met with a bunch of high school friends. We had a mostly social distancing Mm. Uh, drinking a cigar out on somebody's porch and we're like looking around at each other god damn we're a bunch of old men how did this happen <laughs> what's the alternative i guess you know well yeah absolutely yeah no kidding yeah i i like i was i don't know i was back in chicago probably last year so um but i was staying with a friend in uh out in rogers park you know oh yeah so, yeah you still live there yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I, so many roads lead back to Chicago for me. It's so interesting. Yeah. You know, you meet a lot of people out here from the Midwest on the West Coast, too. Yeah, I still value those friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's I mean, there's just something about being around people who you've known for 
30 years or 20 yeah. or whatever. But yeah, absolutely. And I'm always like, I'm from Michigan, so I always put up the mitten, you know, and people are like, oh, Michigan, you know? <laughs> yeah, Illinois doesn't have that. Well, it's, uh, yeah. Some of our, if you stood the right way, our gut could be the middle part of Illinois. <laughs> Blue, yeah. yeah. Maybe a flat top and a gut would work. <laughs> oh my god that's so funny yeah so with um with what you're doing over there like what's the what's the bulk of your job is is really you're the executive director so you run the whole thing and for and do you i know obviously with the pandemic this the space is closed but you normally are running events all the time as well right yeah we um in the past we've had a couple of lectures a month and we get authors and mm. all sorts of different people to come through there uh, the book club's still meeting. Some of the smaller stuff is still meeting. Right. And we had a hit show. We had a music, excuse me, a musical in there called For the Love of a Glove. And it was this sort of fantasy, weird, humorous musical about Michael Jackson and where oh, wow. he got all his musical talents. Oh, wow. And they were just about to extend. And uh, that's when the, the the shutdowns hit. And so... Mm -hmm. All that stuff's still sort of sitting there, yeah. The theater ready to go, but yeah. So it's there's quite a bit of activity in in normal times uh, going on there, and um, so we just try to keep it interesting, you know. Yeah, I uh, so with skepticism and you know the the paranormal and and stuff. I we I remember we talked a little bit last time about magic and magicians, you know, like and the magic castle and you having. Are, are folks that are part of the the um, CFI some, some does that cross over you know magic and magicians in that way too? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a there's a there's a strong connection between the skeptics and the magic community. There's a lot of uh, fandom going in both directions. I think. Sure. And and I personally value um, the magicians, because, especially the good ones. Because, and especially in the early days of us testing uh, paranormal claims, you know, we need to eliminate all the tricks and gimmicks that people might use. And of course, magicians are well tuned in right. to that sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, I'm not a huge fan of magic, but because <laughs> all I do is just sit there the whole time and say, God damn it, when did he make that switch? And how did he do that? And <laughs> um so you know t for me it's like it's like being in school i'm just trying to right i can't enjoy it <laughs> um but yeah um i mean we worked uh, uh we've worked with uh james randy who is the originator of the large uh paranormal challenge money mm. prize okay the magician and uh escapeologist he's in his i think he's in his 90s now Oh wow! Um, but some of the people who are still uh, helping to run uh, his organization, this guy named Banachek, and uh, there's a guy named Max Maven, and there's other people in the skeptic world, okay. uh, Jamie Ian Swiss, who are uh, still valuable assets to our our work. Right. That's so cool. Did you say Max Maven? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, that's right. It should be on your show, huh? <laughs> I was like, what? We'll talk after the... Okay. That sounds <laughs> great. Well, and, you know, if I, I, I pull out a couple of the names from the past, I mean, Carl Sagan, so famous, and Isaac Asimov, that's so, you know, it's like, you're kind of like, oh, these people, and I was like, you know, I, when you said it the first time, I was like, well, what? You know? Um, yeah, Carl Sagan. Um, Carl Sagan's one of, the, one of the first people involved in the organization. Wow. And we, when we opened this new building on uh, Temple Street, Mm -hmm. He named the theater the Carl Sagan Andrewian Theater. Okay. Andrewian was uh, Carl's wife, and uh, she's what a writer producer for the Cosmos TV right. series. Yep. Yeah. So Anne was there for the dedication, and she's also uh, you know a, a friend and a, a great asset to all our work. Sure, that's so cool. Yeah, it's great. So how did how did you get from uh, you know? hometown Chicago out to LA and the CFI what's that origin story look like oh man it's it's convoluted uh <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> well I was doing comedy in Chicago um I don't know if you know this Heather but 
I am still the poet laureate of Calumet City, Illinois. What? <laughs> oh yeah, um, self-proclaimed, but it still counts. Turns out yeah. that you can sure. do that. Wow. Um, so that's a lifetime position, even though um, I have gainful employment outside of that. So I was touring mostly the middle of the country doing stand up in the late 80s, early 90s, making my living from it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a couple different factors arose and it was just kind of time to go take a shot at, at LA. And so um, I moved out here and uh, found myself going back to the Midwest to do to to do paying work because the comedy store and the laugh factory and the improv especially for people they don't know it's not if they it, uh, most people don't get any money and a lot even you know regulars there only get like 25 bucks or 50 or whatever it was back then right so <clears throat> I retired prematurely from the business mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot of backlash to that, as I recall, to my <laughs> retirement. Um, no! No, don't. People <laughs> prostrating themselves in front of my front door. Don't to quit. Don't, please. <laughs> um, so I was teaching traffic school. I ended up doing carpentry for a few years with this guy. I learned a lot about carpentry and building and, and that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. And then um, I found out about the Center for Inquiry and started doing volunteer work for them. And I shot some video for them. And um, in the meantime, I was shooting other video. I made a couple of short films, A Day in the Life of Frank Sinatra, which yeah. is about a homeless man with a famous name. Oh, wow. Um, I directed a play called um, Party of 13, which was a secular retelling of the Last Supper. Um, and I had a black Jesus, not black face Jesus, but an actual black Jesus, which always got a great laugh from the crowd because he would come out to the table. And um, he was probably, the real Jesus was probably black, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a lot of Irish looking mugs in uh, the Middle East in the first century. Jesus was black, okay? If he lived, he was black, so get over it if you're white and you don't, if you have a problem with that. Um, so anyway, it was accurate casting on my part. Mm -hmm. um, so all that stuff was was happening in the 90s. And then, um, yeah, the, this job came open with the uh, Center for Inquiry and they hired me and it's been 20 years now, over to come, uh, 21. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And is it, is it, um, is it, I don't know, is it for-profit, non-profit? All of it's that? A, it's a nationwide nonprofit. We also have Got it. Uh, NGO status with the uh, United mm -hmm. Nations. So we participate. Oh, wow. In as well. Yeah. So it's a worldwide organization. Yeah. We, we used to have sort of uh, branches and more people in other places, mm -hmm. um, but we still have a few. Um, I think there's a guy in Africa who works for us mm -hmm. and um, we used to have some people in, uh, in, Russia and China and uh, so we still have this network of people all over the world um, right they're not all they're not on the payroll I don't think but yeah um, it's still there yeah that's so cool yeah and, and people can become members so what happens when you become a member yeah but like in Los Angeles uh, since we charge for these lectures that we have um, if you're a member for a mere 60 bucks a year, I think it's still that, maybe 80 now. Okay. Um, you get into all the lectures for free and you get discounts on merch. And well, we, uh, up until this year, we were having a conference every year in Las Vegas. Okay. Um, called PsyCon. And that was big. Um, like we would have Richard Dawkins and, um, you know, uh, Salman Rushdie was supposed to be there this year. Uh, wow. We had to cancel it because of the pandemic. But mm -hmm. so that's a bigger gathering, uh, a more national scale of a gathering. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, so your membership uh, gets into all kinds of different stuff. That's so cool. And so with, with what you've done, and I remember we talked about a little bit that, you know, you 
you've been uh, you you get asked to be a part of TV and and all kinds of different things. What's that been like? Um, it's it tries my patience. <laughs> Is that a nice enough way to say it? Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, for instance, I mean, let me, I'll give you two examples. Uh -huh. um, the first example is um, several years ago, I was on the Dr. Phil show. Mm. He has a bunch of psychics on stage and he had, and I have to sit in the audience. Like I don't get equal billing with the psychics, <laughs> which chapped my hide. <laughs> Um, and he like takes their side and uh, all this crap. I, I ended up doing a, a, a reading as I, we, uh, I was supposed to be a psychic and I did a reading on these nine strangers oh. and a couple of them I brought to tears with my reading. And, and by the way, I'm not a good fake psychic reader. <laughs> I know how it's done, but I have very little actual experience in doing right. it. Uh -huh. But I was still able to pull it off enough to make some people tear up and they mm -hmm. were, thought they were talking to their dead dog or whatever it was. Right. And so then Dr. Phil turns on me in mid show and is like, well, how do you explain that? And you know, he's just, it just <laughs> ticked me off that right. he took this, these insane people's uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing like, and this happened a little bit more recently, a couple of years ago, uh, National Geographic shot our investigations group out at the Salton Sea oh. with a bunch of flat earthers. Wow. So, you know, you were sitting on the shore and, you know, you couldn't, we, the idea was to have this target on the other side, the other shore, which was almost 10 miles away. Wow. Yeah. And at that distance, um, the thing's got to be, you know, 30 or 40 feet in the air. And sure enough, oh, wow. that's exactly what happened. You couldn't see it until it was 30 or 40 feet in the air. Wow. And then the other test was we took Craig's, our mutual friend, um, yep. Craig's boat out on the Salton Sea and held up this big target um, that, with, that had horizontal stripes on it. Uh -huh. And the farther you went out, the more of the horizontal stripes disappeared. Oh, wow. Interesting. So, again, two in front of their face demonstrations about the curvature of the earth. <laughs> <clears throat> did that convince a single one of them? No, it did not. Wow. So, that is so wild. Yeah. So we're always on the, like the, we get the, the least amount of time and have to ex exercise the most patience of anyone on the show. Always. Wow. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Well, and it's, it's, if you're the skeptic, right, yeah. then like, you know, like it's the ooh -ah of the psychic and the this, this, this might be real. And I mean, you're probably, are you kind of painted as like the, the like, meh, meh, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're always the wet blanket. Right. And I'm like, I'm sorry, people, but reality, you know, yeah. get used to it. Yeah, completely. That's so funny. Yeah, I would see, I can see that. And so with the magazine, um, and isn't there, an, is there another one? Is there a medical focused one too? Uh, we used to have a, 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 a medical one and we used to have okay. a philosophical one. There are no but it's all in existence. Okay. okay. So it's just, it's just a skeptical inquirer and free inquiry, the two magazines. Have. That's so cool. So, you know, when, when, so the secular humanism, I think that I don't know, do you get a lot of questions that were like, like, what is that? Or like, even when people like look it up, are they like still, what is that? You know? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of tough because, I mean, we're basically atheists and the difference between just atheism and secular humanism mm -hmm. is that atheism is simply just the lack of belief in God. That's all it is. It right. doesn't really necessarily mean anything else. Right. Where secular humanism means you care about equality, you care about education, you care about arts, you care about philosophy, morality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other stuff. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, that, that's a good distinction because I think, you know, when I think when I first heard those terms, I was like, what does that mean? You know, and is it the, the humanist side? And so I guess, and there's humanist and then there's secular humanist. Yeah. Right. You can be a religious humanist. Um, and I think the, 
the religious humanists are pretty close to us philosophically. You know, they might believe in some kind of higher power or, or spiritualism or, or something like that. But mm. yeah, it's basically the the same set of things that you value uh, for right. humanity. Yeah, gotcha. And as far as skeptics go, I feel like, you know, some people like would say or they would peg and be like, all skeptics do is be like, that doesn't exist. That's right. not right. Da, 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 da. And I know that's not what that is. So we would we talk about that a little bit more. Too? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because uh, most of the skeptics I know, and granted, that's a, a little bit of a skewed sample, maybe, <laughs> but th they're in awe of their of the universe and nature and just how reality works. I mean, a lot of them are uh, amateur astronomers. Mm. Um, they, you know, they're hikers. They they just they're just in love with how the world works and how the universe works. And there's right. like great excitement and enthusiasm about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and if you look at Carl Sagan, I mean, astronomer, scientist, all, you know, all of the things, you know, like the wonders of the universe. I mean, he gave us that along, obviously, with, like you were saying with his wife and Isaac Asimov, sci-fi you know, <laughs> writer of the, of, you know what I mean? So it's interesting. I feel like that word sometimes is, is skewed to mean something. Maybe it doesn't, or maybe it's just, I don't know. We always go to like the small, simple version of things. Right. The, 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 the pocket first thought definition of something. And you're right. I mean, listen, our, in the, <laughs> the scientific world's PR people have not been the best over the years. <laughs> You know, we're, we've, uh, you know, the other people that the, the other side of a lot of this stuff, too many to name, but, you know, they're better storytellers. They tend to be more empathetic. Uh, right. All these things that, that make people are drawn to them, mm -hmm. even though all the stuff that they say is, is crazy or, or bullshit, but they're still better people, people, a lot of times. Right. And it's something we need to work on a little bit. Yeah. Well, it, and it's just, you know, even the, I don't know, with, with climate change and so many things, you know, I, I feel like the fact that we have to like meme and Instagram and put on a t-shirt that science is real is sort of ridiculous. It, I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, it's crazy. And this is, I mean, you know, in a way, we've been anticipating the pandemic for 45 years now mm -hmm. because this is what we've been saying the whole time when it gets down to it you got to have good information about stuff that's going to kill you and mm -hmm. you can't just say god's going to protect me or you can't just say some scammer who says drink this and you'll be safe is going to protect me yeah. you need good scientific information and that's what we've been saying all along yeah yeah, and it's been, I mean, and we're watching it play out, you know. I mean, we're watching it play out anyway, but like at just an exorbitant amount right now with everything that's going on and listening to, you know, all these different opinions and the politicizing of, of so many things. It's just like, it's like, wow, you know. Um, yeah, yeah you, there's, there's this thing out there called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh -uh, but no. look up Dunning-Kruger effect. It's okay. basically... Uh, people thinking that their level of expertise about any given subject is much higher than it actually is. Mm. And of course, Donald Trump is the, <laughs> is the poster child for Dunning-Kruger. He thinks he's an expert about everything, and there's probably nothing that he's an expert about. <laughs> Maybe running a, a beauty pageant. Maybe right. thing. Yeah. Um, mm. But so, and this is the problem, because everybody, you see something on Fox News or you read it on a wacky website somewhere of someone who thinks they know what they're talking about and they don't mm -hmm. and you base your actions and behavior on it to your own peril in something like a pandemic so yeah. you know it's it's thinning the herd a little bit these <laughs> these tendencies yeah no, that's true I find that you know in conversations about the pandemic and what's happening with Black Lives Matter and the Me Too, like Me Too movement, all of all of the things that have been going on here in the last while. It's like 
I think for me, I, I like to, one, I'm, I love to learn. And so I'm, I'm always about learning and asking questions, but it's also that I, it's important to me to know your facts, you know, to, if you're, you know, th there's one thing about coming at something with emotion, like I believe this because blah and okay. But I also feel like that to be effective. And if you want to like have an actual conversation with somebody and not just a screaming match, being able to under say why and to cite references and sources. And I feel like that's something that people just, they just want to scream and post anonymous rude tweets and, and they don't really want to dialogue. They just want to scream at each other, you know? Yeah, right. And that's, and, and that's probably the biggest problem that's going on in my opinion, in the country right now is that we are so polarized. Mm -hmm. All, all we do, we and again, Trump's behind this. He split us down the middle and made it sound like you're either with us or against us. And that just isn't the case. We're all Americans. We're all human beings. We should, you know, find our common ground and have these dialogues and yeah. try to solve some of this stuff instead of just hating on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's about unity and equality and treating each other that, the, you know, in good ways and stuff. I, yeah, I had a conversation with, with someone and we were talking about, um, it, they, were, it, they were having a hard conversation and he was kind of like, didn't know what to say. And, and I, and I was sort of saying, well, I was like, I don't know all the answers, but what I do know is that I, th I think it's about asking a question, asking the why, getting some understanding from somebody and then you know, say either, you know, if it's, it's something that you did or whatever, I'll do better. Or, you know, thank you for sharing that with me so I can think about it, you know? And, and that, especially in a kind of explosive moments, it doesn't always help, but I think it helps some, you know? Oh, oh for sure. For sure. And it just, it's, I mean, I can see, I, I've, I've been on both sides. I mean, I've, you know, called people nuts and maniacs and everything else. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it just, their eyes just glaze over, you lose them. If you're actually trying to convince someone or have some empathy toward someone yeah. or let them see a new point of view, you have to make a connection and that's not beating them over the head. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think something in your mm -hmm. line of work would also be looking at like belief and faith. Yeah, and 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 not just specific beliefs and faiths, but exactly that, that, that how people come to uh, have beliefs and why they believe in uh, confirmation bias and tribalism and all these mm. factors that contribute to why we believe the things we do. I always, I go to the this, uh, uh, Christian high school every year, a couple of times a year mm. to um, do the lecture. Uh, they do a, a, a religions of the world class, comparative religion. Mm. And to the guy's credit, he invites me every twice a year oh, to wow. represent non-belief. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I ask these kids, um, how many of you are in a completely different religion than your parents are? And none of them raise their hands. Most people believe the religion that they were born into. Mm -hmm. They don't really do a serious search based on merit of what's the best religion. They right. just drop, they fall into it, and that's where they stay their whole lives. Right. So, and that's not the, just the case with religion, but so many things, right? Right, right. Politics and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and listen, our brains are not uh well suited for the complexities of the modern world these brains are built for hunter gathering on the african savanna yeah. not for you know social mass social media and um tr this sorts of worldwide tribalism and 24-hour news cycles and all this i mean we know about uh terrible things that are happening all over the world almost instantaneously yep. and our ancestors you know even 60 70 years ago 
never had the never had that problem. You know, yep. what does that do to people that mm -hmm. when they listen to that stuff all the time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we I talk about I've written about you know talking about what you're saying, the lizard brain, you know, the whole fight or flight reflex and all of that, and you know, it's like we're we're given we're given these noggins quite a stretch, you know, <laughs> most of the time because I think people lead with unfortunately we lead with our fears you know yeah just something like the size of the universe i mean it's 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 almost incomprehensible mm -hmm. that something could be a, a a you know millions of light years away even right. brain can't can't accept that and mm -hmm. if the people who wrote the bible may have actually known how big the universe was and that we're only this little tiny speck in it mm -hmm. who knows maybe the choice the story changes a little bit yeah no that's true yeah I think I think what you do is fascinating. I when when we were talking about it, I was just like, oh my gosh, tell me everything. About it. <laughs> so so interesting. I love it that that it exists. You know what I mean? That it that there was. It's. I think. I think you know. It, I don't know. Do you feel like it's like is counterbalance the right word? Maybe I don't know. You know what I mean? Like because because it, it's not like I, I I don't ever get from you from when we talked before and what I read, it's like, it's not us versus them. It's, it's more, let's, let's look at all the different flavors and the sides of things to come to understanding and to actually come together with our differences. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, counterbalance is, is, is a way to look at it. Although from my perspective, it always seems like a, a BB us on one side of the scale and an mm -hmm. anvil on the other mm. um and in the in the in the time that i've been alive and paying attention to this stuff it used to be that you know like i was talking about earlier in the 60s and 70s there a claim would come up and people would go out and they'd investigate it and you get try to get as good inf of information and that'd be the end mm. of it now since the internet is virtually universal and the ability right. to create bad information that can travel everywhere right. is universal. Sure. Um, the problem is shifted over to what's, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? To how do we go? What is this process that we use to determine what's right? Cause there's, you can be bombarded with right. anything and we yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, um, it's like fact checking, you know, when we've got, you know, the whole fake news thing and everything else. It's like, like, I know people, what is the Snopes, you know, dot com oh. that people use, you know, to go like, is this real, you know, because um, people do want to know that. But it's like, where do you go? And obviously, you know, CFI has, you know, some of that with what you do, but it's it's hard to know where to get what's what's. I got real I don't to get air quotes around it, you know, especially when you have people in power saying it's all fake or especially yeah. anything that doesn't jibe with whatever mm. you know, they're saying is all yeah. fake. So you really do need some other ways and sources that you can mostly trust to get yeah. Good information. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think y'all are one of them. So that's really cool. Well, uh, we try. <laughs> hey you know what that's all we can do right um uh, a good a good try and a good do um so i want to uh ask you my last question that i always ask um and uh so it, very interested in sparks and moments in our lives and thank you for sharing your origin story and all of that um wondering uh what you know person place thing moment uh in your life um seats you kind of in today and who for who you are in this moment I'm going to say um, my first confession. I grew up Catholic, St. Mike's Church in Wheaton. Yeah, we same. Yep. Um, and uh, so, first of all, I'm, I'm trying to make this really short, but it's fine. I, um, <laughs> We're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, for some reason, I was held back a year from Sunday school. Hmm. Now, I don't know what kind of problem you have to have to be held back in Sunday school. Um, well, I, I do know what problem because I just hated going to church. So I think my mother just said, okay, we'll, we'll put it off one more year. 
So I'm, 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 I'm behind, I'm with the class behind me, which is humiliating in, in Sunday school. And then, so finally we get to the point where it's time for our first confession. And I missed the week where, you know, you go into the phone booth and you talk to the priest and you do the uh -huh. thing. Right. So you get your trial run in kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before you do it for real. But right. that counted because you're saying the real stuff, you know. Right. Uh -huh. So, so I show up the next week and it's, there's a priest teaching the class and he says, uh, Jim, you just uh, stay over after class and we'll do the first confession. So first of all, I'm looking the guy right in the eye instead of get, having the screen and being in the dark. So there's absolutely no anonymity at all <laughs> to the confession, which is problematic. Um, so the rest of the class leaves and I'm sitting in a chair across from him and I do the whole thing. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, blah, blah, blah. This is my first confession. And I proceeded to lie my ass off <laughs> to him and said, you know, I stole a candy bar, which I didn't. I swore, which I probably did. Um, a couple other, just like, just made up run of the mill. I just want to get out of here. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he gives me the 10 Hail Marys or whatever my penance was, punishment, penance. And uh, went home. So I'm even like, maybe even on the way home, I'm thinking, uh, you know, we're, I'm waiting for the lightning. Let's see, we came first circle to the lightning guy. Right. Waiting for the lightning to strike me because I just lied my ass off to a priest who's got a direct conduit to God. And uh, lightning didn't hit on the way home and it didn't hit the next day and or the next day and I didn't get cancer and my legs were never chopped off and I'm not burning until this day. I'm not burning in hell or anything. Um, so after a while, I started thinking, this just doesn't sound right. I mean, there's <laughs> God's supposed to be able to read your mind. And, and I would expect, you know, the priests, you know, I don't hold them to that standard now either, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but still, it just, it introduced this idea that there's something not as all powerful as they've been leading me to believe all this time involved here. And that sent me on the road to uh, being skeptical about religious beliefs, which then opened the door to uh, being skeptical about anything that didn't sound right and looking into it and learning why people had these beliefs, right. which lead me to yeah. this right here. Yeah. <laughs> St. <Saint> Mike's. <laughs> It burned down. Why would God let a church burn down? That's what I want to know. I don't know. I know. I'm. Yep. Yeah. Like, same church, same high school. What a coinky dink. I think I need your two hundred thousand dollars just for coincidences. Yeah, I do. And you know what though? I love coincidences. I love freak occurrences. I love high odds, weird things. Yeah. Yeah. I be I believe that's what I said to you because we were talking about your job and then we did we had the whole Chicago Wheaton Wheaton Central what and I was like what do you think about coincidences <laughs> and I love it where I was at a skeptical conference one time and I was chewing a piece of gum uh -huh. and I threw it across like the, our booth and it landed in the garbage on the edge of a piece of paper that was standing up like it was you know, it was card stock or something, uh -huh. but it landed right on the edge. And I was like, check it out, everyone. Look at this. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that is so funny. I love it. Well, you're a delight. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we actually did this again. So. <laughs> yeah, let's hope it works. I know. I know. Stay away, you know. <laughs> Put the whammy back. back yeah. woo, woo, woo. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on and sharing your story with us. So. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, everybody. That has been another episode of the Mavens Do It Better podcast. And here is to another big, beautiful day on this blue spitting sphere. Thanks, everybody. And...